the, the general answer to what are ways that we give ourselves self-empathy before going into a conversation would be, I would sit down and I would surface all of my feelings and all of the things that I'm needing. So I'm feeling scared and I'm needing safety and I'm feeling anxious and I'm needing predictability or I'm needing, you know, that would be about the conversation. If I had more information about the context, I could give you a little bit more about what might be happening in the context. Um, if I were to make something up, I would say it could be, um, you know, I'm feeling some frustration and I'm uh, wanting some trust between myself and another person or whatever that is. And I want to ground myself in acknowledging my feelings, feeling my feelings and getting very, very connected to the needs that I'm going to bat for. What are the needs that I'm wanting? And then I might want to make for myself a whole variety of ways that I could get those needs met. One of which is an outcome that I'm going to go to bat for in this conversation. But the reason I'm going to come up with a lot of other options as well is to help me feel spaciousness around mm -hmm. my preferred strategy. Because if I can only see one way that it can happen, it's going to be hard for me to not be attached to that outcome. The outcome that I want to be attached to if I'm navigating something in a relationship with someone is that you and I find a way forward that works well for both of us and that we are able to tell our deepest truth to one another about where we are at so that we have all the data and information we need in order to come to make a decision about what will best meet both of our needs in the most sustainable way in the long term. And that means being willing in the short term to get an answer that I don't like, but that ultimately is going to meet my needs in the long term. So for example, um, just uh, building on the question that Leah was bringing in, let's say that we had um, a relationship and we're at a bit of a crossroads. And we're trying to figure out, like, do we move forward? Do we not? There are things I'm needing. There are things you're needing. How do we do this? And I'm really, I'm going to make something up. I'm really attached to we move in together. You're really attached to we live in two separate homes. So what I want to do is get underneath the strategy of whether we live in one house or two. And I want to get at what needs of mine would be met. Why do I want to move in together? Why do you want to stay in two homes? And if I can get at, for example, I really love the intimacy of daily routines. Um, I want the ease of um, not needing to make plans to see one another. And you are really going to bat for, um, I, I still want a certain amount of choice and freedom and space and independence in my life. And we both put all of those needs on the table. We're able to have a conversation where I'm like, how do we get, how do we create a structure where you can have all the choice and the freedom and the ease, and I can have the togetherness and the closeness. Do you want that too? This is where we begin by where are we, where is there overlap and where, where do we meet and where are we different? And then in the places where we have the same needs in that moment, what is a way that we can move forward together? So it might not be moving in together. It might not be staying apart. We might find some, we're going to travel the world and live in Airbnbs. That way there's no big commitment to buying a house or investing in a lease, but we're going to basically live together from month to month as we travel. Like we may find some creative solution that honors where we're each at that doesn't require each person to change, compromise, give up something. And if I'm scared, for example, uh, if I have an ultimatum and I'm scared that if I say that ultimatum, I might lose the other person, then self-empathy in that case would be proactively grieving that and imagining myself okay on the other end so that the other person isn't staying with me to take care of my feelings. I don't want somebody to be in a relationship with me, for example, because they just don't want to hurt my feelings and they can't stand how upset I get. And so they quietly and passively and resentfully just stay with me because they're avoiding uh, the feelings that might come from us deciding that this isn't going to work. I, I think it might sound something like, 
when I look at the situation, I have a really strong preference for blah, 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 blah. And in an ideal world, if everything were going to line up for me, it would look like X, Y, Z and A, B, C. And this is what I'm really going to bat for. This is what I really want. And this is what would be best case scenario for me. And that said, I also care about how that might impact other stakeholders in the situation and the organization and blah, blah, blah. And um, I'd like to find a solution that actually is not only good for me, but is also good for all of us. And I wonder if we could be in some conversation about what that might look like. I have a lot of care for the job or whatever it is that we are creating or what we started together. And I'm really invested in the mission and the vision. Um, and I'd like to find a way to repair what's been glitchy and to, and to move forward together and keep creating something together. It sounds like you're trying to find the sweet spot between um, how do I convey how much I care about this without begging and pleading and being uh, needy and clingy about it? And so when you find yourself speaking about like, I really want this, you're worrying that that's coming across like, please don't make me leave. Please don't kick me out. Please don't get rid of me. Please forgive me. Please keep me. Well, I, I, I think you're on the right track when you say, um, you know, sometimes you just got to get in there and say it and then be okay with it sounding the way it sounds. So that I think there's some truth to that. And the second thing is the way I'm hearing you on the call right now with me, I would never, ever have thought that you sound whiny. That is not a word that would have come to my mind ever. What I'm hearing is uh, a lot of care and a lot of tenderness and wanting to be thoughtful and mindful and careful that you are showing up in a way that is reflecting what's actually in your heart. That's what comes across to me. Yeah, I think if you can settle into your body, maybe before the conversation, I'd really do some work to just get back into my body mm -hmm. and soothe my nervous system. You know, a little bit of like, you know, butterfly tapping on your shoulders, breathing, you know, relaxing and letting yourself know whatever happens, it's going to be okay. And my only job is to be as transparent and honest with them about what's in my heart and then find out what happens from there. And maybe they can uh, rise up and meet me there and we end up co-creating something really amazing and maybe they don't have the ability to do that and then I get that data and I find that out and then I can grieve that and you're allowed to want what you want you're allowed to have strong preferences you're allowed to go to bat for something the um, attachment and demand part is when I'm insisting that it has to be that way or it should be that way or other people are wrong for not doing it that way that's where we cross the line into toxic that's where we get a whole different set of, um, you know, impacts, but uh, conviction about where I am, who I am, what I long for, what I stand for, that's not being attached to an outcome. That's, that's clarity and empowerment.